church family, you take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to camp out uh, this morning. I know that my wife and I and our family are relatively new to the fellowship at DFBC, so I'll make a quick introduction. My name is Brent Thomason, and uh, we joined a little over a year and a half ago, and uh, we uh, serve alongside another gentleman named Brent Davidson in the Young Families and Young Marriage class. I think the Lord has a sense of humor because we have a Brent Davidson and a Brent Thomason, and a Brent Davidson is married to Andrea, and a Brent Thomason is married to Alina. So there's a lot of confusion sometimes that goes along uh, with that, but we're very happy to serve in our Young Families and Young Marriage class. It's a privilege to speak to you today, and I'm so glad that Pastor Miguel gave me um, this opportunity He's taken a little bit of a break. He needs a respite. He needs a time away. And I think that's important that we allow our ministers, our pastors, to take a break from the ministry to be ministered to. You know, Mark 6.31, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, come away with me by yourselves to a quiet place so you can rest. And so, Pastor Miguel needs that break, not to take a break from the Lord, but to press into the Lord so that he himself can be refreshed, so that he comes back to pour into us. So when Pastor Miguel and his family are absent, let's not let them be absent from our minds as we pray for them, that the Lord would accomplish that rest in their lives to bring them back refreshed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I've titled the text this morning, Saved, Sanctified, and Standing Firm. And I want to begin, as kind of Pastor Miguel does, with a question, just to kind of get the creative juices flowing this morning as we begin thinking about this text. My question for us is this, when was the last time you were thankful for Christians who behaved and acted Christianly? And we live in a very depressing world. Uh, Turn on the news. There's probably not anything positive coming across the channel. Uh, Many of us will get in the habit of sort of doom scrolling on our news feeds, and one article after another only talks about negative things. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of evil in the world. And my concern is that sometimes we allow that atmosphere of pessimism, that atmosphere of negativity to infiltrate our thoughts and our thinking towards Christians. So that if a fellow believer does something nice to me, immediately I think something suspicious. There's an, there's an ulterior motive going on here. Why are they being kind to me? They probably will have an ask later on. Do you see how that works? And Paul is going to command us this morning, when we think of believers who are behaving Christianly, our knee-jerk reaction should be to thank God that they're living out Jesus in their life. And that's what we're going to unpack today. In fact, if I were to kind of give you a trailer teaser of the entire text today, if I were to distill it down into one summary statement, it would be really this, that Paul gives us four points. Give thanks for sanctified saints who stand firm in their works and words. That's that's the nuts and bolts of our message this morning. Give thanks for people who are living the Christian life while they are standing firm in the midst of a lot of difficulties in the world, especially as they act and behave through their works and their words according to Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to unpack today. Paul is basically asking us to sort of cultivate this spirit of gratitude towards the Lord, to foster, if you will, what we tell our boys all the time, have a happy heart. That's what Paul wants us to have this morning as we think about fellow uh, believers. So let's take a look then at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. I'm going to read the text through and then we'll begin to unpack it. Paul writes this to the church, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this that He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions which were taught to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now, 
May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, may he comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. This is the word of the Lord. The first thing that Paul tells us is to give thanks. Simply give thanks. Always give thanks. This is not a season that Paul is calling us to. It's not a moment that he's calling us to. It's not like the day of Thanksgiving where around the end of Thanksgiving or around the end of November, we have an a attitude of gratitude towards the Lord. He's not calling us to an occasion. He's calling us to a lifestyle. The very fact that Paul has to tell us always give thanks is almost an indictment on our hearts that our disposition is normally to grumble, to gossip. And so he's calling us upward and outward Oh no, brothers and sisters, give thanks. That's the standard that Paul has for our lives. Always give thanks. You know, in a, the letter prior to 1 Thessalonians, or the, to the same church, 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, pray without ceasing. In other translations, always pray. You see, Paul envisions the Christian, and, Christian lifestyle as a lifestyle. It's something you are constantly doing, not something you occasionally do, on a designated time, on a designated day or days of the week. Give thanks, Paul says. It's interesting, Paul never calls us to grumble. He never calls us to complain. He calls us to be thankful. It takes a good Christian person to see the negativity in the world and find the spiritual silver lining. It takes the person who is thinking God-like thoughts to look at the world and see an opportunity for redemption, not damnation. That's what Jesus did when he stepped into our lives. Paul says, give thanks. Find that position so that you can offer praise uh, to the Lord. Look at this. You might think to yourself, Well, it was easy for Paul to say that because I just perceive him as a cheerful fellow all the time. He was just happy. I mean, he was, after all, the person who in the Philippian jail was able to sing praises. God just created him a little bit different than me. But but no, friends. Paul is not saying this is something that God has specifically gifted him with, the ability to give thanks in the midst of difficulty. He is saying all of us should. Paul was not living in a sugar-coated world. If you look in your scriptures, there were 12 verses that came right before our text. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, Paul outlines this doomsday message that's on the horizon. He talks about the end times. He talks about the man of lawlessness who will be empowered by Satan's power himself to bring about a great deception on the earth. He'll talk about how people who are sitting in the pews and not really convinced and convicted of the Lord Jesus Christ will be persuaded by this deception and there will be this mass mass exodus, this mass exiting of the church. That's that's not a sugar-coated world that Paul paints. And yet he says, even in the midst of that difficulty, give praise. So you and I, should be able to find a way in the midst of our difficult lives, in the world we find ourselves in, we should find a way to give praise, give thanks to God for fellow brothers and sisters. So let's think about that just for a moment. Is there someone in your life that you hold in such high esteem for the way they're faithfully living their life that you often think of them, and the moment you think of them, you are thankful for them? Do you have a role model in your life? Someone who is sort of that proverbial iron sharpening iron who's constantly calling you upward and outward that you can give praise for. Conversely, let me ask this. When people think of Brent Thomason, when people think of you, what is their first thought in their mind? Is it one of praise and thanksgiving and thankfulness to God? If not, We've got some work to do. We've got some prayers to pray that the Lord Jesus would work himself into our lives to work out the thing that they are thinking so that all they think about is thankfulness. That's where we need to push ourselves to. I'm I'm thinking, Randall, where are you at? I'm thinking of this song, an older song that we used to sing 
at least back in the church up in Podunk, Oklahoma, where I grew up, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Now think about that. That's what the text is saying. Give thanks to God for you because of what God is doing in your life. Not because you're funny, though you may be. Not because you're gifted and talented, though certainly God has given that to you. But give thanks because of what Jesus is doing in your life. Simply put, when we think of believers, let's not gossip or grumble, let's give thanks. But Paul is moving on, and so are we. Give thanks for sanctified saints. Give thanks for sanctified saints. What does the text say? Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this that He called you through our gospel, that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this, friends. The greatest thing that you can be thankful for in that person is that God is in their life. Often when we think about something, even someone as close and intimate as our spouse, I must confess, many times when I think about my spouse, when I think about my children, it's often from a selfish position. I'm thankful for them for what they do for me. I'm thankful for them because they make my life easier. I'm thankful for them because they help me and provide assistance to all the things I want to attain. I'm thankful for them because of what I get out of the relationship. But that's not what Paul is calling us to do. He's calling us to thank God for what he is doing in that person's life, independent from us. That is the selfless, sacrificial praise we are working towards. Paul commands us to be thankful that they are growing. See, salvation isn't uh, uh, or rather, let me say this. Paul is saying to be thankful for them, not because they are saved and stagnant, uh, but because they're saved and being sanctified. So let's break down those two terms just to make sure we're all on the same page. When we talk about sanctified saints, saints is not often a word that we use uh, in our evangelical Protestant churches. Oftentimes we think of saints in the, in the, in the lens of our Catholic friends. Uh, with the uh, iconography and the halo that surrounds those old uh, pictures. But but saints is a biblical term, first and foremost, and it's merely referencing a person who is saved, someone who's been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, someone who has been redeemed and regenerated, someone who has once estranged from the family of God and now has been adopted into the family of God. That saved saint. That is their identity. That's who they are. It's not what they do. It's who they are. They are a saint in the eyes of God. But it's not just the saint, because people can be saved and not producing the hundredfold fruit that we're after. People could be saved and indeed a little stagnant, not producing the fruit of the Spirit, not multiplying disciple makers, which is our vision. And so Paul says specifically, we want to thank God for those who are working out their salvation, those who are being sanctified. Now, sanctified is what they do. It is the process. Saved is who they are. Sanctified is what they do. It's the Holy Spirit working in their life on a daily basis to make them look a little bit more like Jesus today than they did yesterday. That's sanctification in the process. I remember when Alina and I bought our first home back in 2015, and we we purchased that home, and immediately, man, let me tell you, it was a process. I wished it would have been an instantaneous moment for everything to be moved in and all the pictures up on the wall, but it was a process. And after the other residents were removed from the premises, we had to go in and gut it. We ripped up all the floors and laid hard flooring throughout, and I I laid hard flooring throughout our house, and I've got the hurt knees to prove it. 
and we painted the walls and we laid new baseboards and we had to do new countertops. And it was, I mean, we had to do all this preparatory work before we could ever even bring the boxes into the house. And then once you get those boxes into the house, you still have, I mean, it's like the work's just now begun. Now you've got to put it up all on the walls. And bit by bit, the house becomes the home. Bit by bit, the structure begins to resemble and imitate what it is you want it to be. That's like sanctification. The Lord at the moment of salvation evicted Satan from your heart. He wasn't paying good rent. He evicted Satan from your heart and he begins to inject you with a big dosage of Holy Spirit power. And bit by bit, that Holy Spirit, he transforms your life. So Paul is thankful that God is working in their lives and their lives are bearing testimony to that process. But that salvation moment, notice, happened at a particular time. It was a moment in time. When we look back at the story of Acts in Acts chapter 17, Paul came and preached the gospel to them. Now clearly they had actually heard about the message before when we trace it further back in Acts chapter 2 and we see all the people that came to Pentecost, there were people that came to Pentecost representative of all the regions of the Mediterranean world. Uh, the church in Rome was already founded before Paul ever got there because the Christians, or really the Jews that came to Pentecost and were converted to Christianity, they go back to Rome and they teach others about Jesus. There are were influences already in Thessalonica, and yet no church had been birthed. And Paul comes along and he preaches the gospel, and they are saved. People are not saved through a miracle or a dream, though God used and still uses those mechanisms to woo people to himself for salvation. People are saved through the hearing, or the reading, if you will, of Scripture. Think about what Paul said. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. That is why Scripture tells us to go scatter the gospel seed. Only then will they get saved. So people get saved when they hear Paul preaching. In this instance, the word. I guess I might be able to compare it to this phone right here. Uh, Let's see here. Hey Siri, set a timer for five minutes. Five minutes, counting down. Now isn't that interesting? That phone has heard every word I've said thus far in this sermon. It never talked back to me until now, until I called it by name. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. I imagine when you think about your conversion experience, you did not just wake up one morning and decide to get saved. And very likely, it probably wasn't the first time you heard the message of salvation. No, gospel seed had been scattered on your hard heart. And through different persons and touch points, your heart began to become a little bit more fertile to receive that gospel seed so that at that moment, the Holy Spirit could come along and convict you and you yield to the message of Christ. At that moment, you're transferred from darkness into light. The Holy Spirit comes along and says, John, it's now time. The Holy Spirit comes along and says, Tim, it's now time. And so when Paul came and preached the gospel message, the church at Thessalonica was birthed and got saved. Paul says, give thanks for sanctified saints. That's who we give thankfulness or give thanks for. Paul then carries on and he says, look here. We were saved and we are being sanctified by the Spirit as we continue to place faith in the truth. Salvation is worked out in us continually trusting the truths of Scripture. He calls us through the gospel so that we might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I reflect back on our testimony and we begin to reminisce in it and we begin to share it, Do we think about it in terms of what we had to give up or what we gained? You see, Paul is saying, when you came to Christ, you had everything to gain. Maybe you're a brand new believer. I know that I was guilty this a while, and and 
as we listened at camp, when I was growing up at camp and these wonderful people would get saved, sometimes we would reminisce and we'd spend perhaps a little too much time talking about what we had to give up for Jesus rather than talking a little bit more about what we gained through Jesus Christ. Paul says you have everything to gain. The things that you consider gain, you ought to consider loss, says Paul in Philippians chapter 3. So we give thanks for sanctified saints. But Paul carries on and he says, give thanks for sanctified saints who stand firm. In fact, look at the charge that he gives the church. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold on to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Paul indeed had to command them to stand firm because he, he realizes that salvation isn't a life to be lived passively. It, it's not a life that's lived when things are acting upon us. But think about what Jesus says in Matthew when the question is posed, who do the people say that I am? And he turns to the disciples and then he says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father is who is in heaven revealed it to you. And I tell you, you're Peter and upon this rock, I'll build the church. And the gates of Hades will not stand against it. And beloved, the last time I checked, those wonderful gated communities weren't to keep the rich people in. <laughs> they were to keep folk like me out. <laughs> gates are defensive mechanisms. Unless you're Samson, you're not picking up at a gate to swing at anybody, okay? Gates are defense. And yet Paul, Jesus says, the gates will not prevail against you. You see, Christianity is to be on the offensive. It doesn't mean we harm or bulldoze over people, but the, but the belief that we so dearly hold to should be gaining ground, should be spreading. The kingdom ought to be growing says Paul. Give thanks for sanctified saints who stand firm. Those dear brothers and sisters at that early church had to stand firm. Th think about the story with me. In Acts chapter 17, as Paul comes, Paul gets somewhere between two to three weeks with them before he's literally run out of town. and says that he has about two Sabbath days, so at the very least two full weeks, uh, perhaps a little bit more depending upon when he comes and when he goes, and all of a sudden there's a uh, pushback. Uh, there's uh, animosity, there's um, uh, an oppressor, so to speak. The, the Jewish leading persons and even some of the wealthier Gentiles who don't like this message of salvation uh, sort of uh, uh, rally the troops, as it were, incite the mob, and they have to run Paul out of town. And poor Jason, sort of collateral damage. They, they grab him and he has to post bail uh, just to be able to get out of prison. That young church, I mean, freshly saved and already they're being persecuted by their fellow Jews. So Paul meant it in earnest that we need to stand firm once we are saved. Because if we are living the Christianly life, then we're probably coming under attack. Because Satan is being evicted from the hearts of other persons with whom we have influence. And he doesn't like that. That's why Paul tells us, stand firm. And put on that armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6, that breastplate of righteousness and that belt of truth, those shoes of peace, that shield of faith, that helmet of salvation, and the sword of God's word. Do that, Paul says. Stand firm. He also says, as we're standing firm, hold fast to the word of that you receive from us, whether the first letter I wrote to you and now the second one, or recall the words I spoke to you when I was with you. Now think about this young church. Think about your, your own Christian walk. This, this church was some three weeks old and they're already undergoing persecution. They, they didn't have anything but really Paul's teaching when he was there. And a couple of months passed and they received the first letter to the Thessalonians and now the second Thessalonian correspondence. To be quite frank, they don't have a lot of material to work with. And yet Paul's teaching them about end times. And yet Paul is teaching them about Antichrist. And yet Paul is teaching them to stand firm in, in view of the great apostasy, in, in view of the great exodus that will happen in the church in the future. They clung fast with all their life to the Scriptures. What are we doing to hide God's Word in our heart? 
Are we making God's word a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path? Or are we spiritually feeding ourselves Sunday after Sunday and spiritually fasting throughout the week? What are we doing to make sure we are holding fast to the scripture and the teaching of God? I encourage you, if you don't have an accountability partner, somebody with whom you can do life together in a closer and more intimate way, to seek out that person through one of our journey groups, perhaps. I encourage you, if you don't have a regular reading plan, to, to have one so that it prompts you on a daily basis to digest God's Word. No one has to remind Brent Thomason to go eat lunch. And yet my wife will have to remind me, you, you've checked emails long enough this morning, you need to read Scripture. Isn't that interesting? May, may our soul hunger and thirst for righteousness in His Word as the deer on these 100 degree days is panting for water. May that be us. May we hold fast and firmly to the Scripture and God's Word. Lastly, Paul teaches us this. Give thanks for sanctified saints who stand firm in their works and in their words. Look at the Scripture. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, may he comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. I read a scripture this week, Zephaniah 3.17. What a refreshment to my soul that God sings over me, that he delights in me. You know, oftentimes maybe we think of God as this distant person who is uh, merely uh, counting peas, as it were, and, or a bean counter, as it were, good deeds and bad deeds, ready to jump out and grab you at your next misstep. And yet Zephaniah reminds us that God delights in us. He delights in us because His Spirit lives in us to make us look more like Him. Paul affirms that here in 2 Thessalonians. God is our biggest cheerleader. Isn't that fun? God cheers us on. He builds us up. Paul's prayer is that God would just be God, that he would comfort us, that he would love us because that's who he is at his core. He loves, he comforts, he strengthens. Paul's prayer is that God would be God to that persecuted new church in Thessalonica. That's Paul's prayer for us that God cheers us on, are we availing ourselves to His strength? As we even alluded to, the different uh, armors that we put on, the, uh, really the different pieces of equipment that we put on, only one is an offensive mechanism, and it's not ours. It's God's. The sword of the Spirit. He desires to be strength inside of us. We don't stand firm by our own might. We stand in the strength of the Lord. Look at what also Paul says. He says that the Christian life, if lived rightly, is lived holistically. Um, think about scriptures that Paul tells us. Glorify God, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. That's a holistic, comprehensive picture that all of life will be glorifying to God. And so Paul asks God to be God, to comfort and strengthen their hearts through every good work, or word, whether it's a deed or a thought or a thought that matriculates into a word, a conversation, a speech, all should be strengthened by the Lord so that we can do a holistic work of God. The quote by Francis Assisi that if uh, uh, preach and if necessary, use words, the well-intended has led a lot of people astray. We don't merely just live the godly life. No, Paul's admonition is that we're speaking words about him. Faith comes by hearing, not by seeing you live the godly life. Faith comes by hearing you speak about the godly life, speak about the Lord. So we might ask ourselves, what are we doing on behalf of the Lord if Paul's prayer is that we be strengthened for every good work. What then are we doing for the Lord so that he can magnify his strength through us? 
If Paul's prayer is that we be strengthened in order to speak a good word, what are we saying about God? This is Paul's prayer for us. Paul prays that the Holy Spirit would supernaturally come inside of our lives and sort of flex his biceps (laughs) so that people would see his strength in us, not our own strength. Let's think about some final thoughts. What can we take away with as we conclude today? Let's go back to the very beginning as we wrap up. When we think about believers, let's think in a way that gives thanks to God. But conversely, let us be a people who live in a way that fosters thankfulness in others' lives. When we view our salvation, let us think about it in terms of what we have Gained. I think sometimes when we really think about what we gain, the sacrifices we make on behalf of the Lord in this earth pale in in proper comparison. I think that's especially a message for our young people. I know the peer pressure that you experience on a day-to-day basis, and, and by living the godly life, you are naturally distancing yourself from the way the rest of the world is behaving. And that can make you feel marginalized and ostracized. That can make you feel weird and an outsider, so to speak. And you might think, look at what all I'm giving up for Jesus. Why not ask God to recalibrate that thinking of what you will gain in heaven one day by living the godly life now? What are we doing for the Lord? And what are we saying about the Lord? I challenge you this week to start thinking about one person that is that model for you. It, it's, remember the words of Paul. Paul commands the church at Corinth, follow me as I follow Christ. Find your Paul or your Paulina, okay? Well, whoever it is, find that person. Meditate on their actions and their words. Think about how they're living their life according to God's word. And then I'm gonna challenge you to let that person know that you're thankful that they're living the faithful life. Maybe do that this week. Let's pray. Father, we do give you praise. We give you praise not because of who we are, but of who you are in us. We thank you for your spirit that you have freely given to us. We thank you that that spirit, he is our pledge. He is our down payment. He is our earnest money that we will be one day with you in heaven. We thank you for that spirit that binds us together even right now as your bride the church, one church, one baptism, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we continue to push off the lies that make us think we're separate and that there are divisions and demarcations. May we see ourselves in unity with one another. And may that thought then foster an attitude of praise. It's in Christ's name we ask these things. Amen.